morning and welcome to our service today. Today we light the first of the Advent candles. It's one of the blue candles. It's the prophecy candle. It reminds us of the prophecies of the Old Testament that foretold the coming of our Savior. It also reminds us of the prophecies in the New Testament that tell us about our Savior coming again a second time. Our theme for this Advent and Christmas season is illustrations of Emmanuel. And so there's different pictures in the Bible that point us ahead to prophesy to us who Emmanuel is and what he would do for us. And so our first hymn this morning is O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. <laughs> in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious God, 
Father, I am sinful by nature, and I have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a call servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And let us pray. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above, and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Protect us by your strength, and save us from the threatening dangers of our sins. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. May you see. Our Old Testament reading for this, the first Sunday in Advent, is written in the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 2. We don't get too far into this reading, and Isaiah talks about the latter days, and that's where we are now. We're in the latter days. We're in the days um, at the end of the world before Jesus comes again. And so the prophecy here is talking about what the kingdom of God will be like, the mountain of the Lord, the Lord's house to which all people come. Also then looking ahead even farther to the end of the world and to the joy of being in the glory of heaven, where there will be no more fighting and no more pain anymore. 
This is the message that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. This will take place in the latter days. The mountain of the Lord's house will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and all nations will stream to it like a river. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. Then he will instruct us about his ways, and we will walk in his paths. But from Zion the law will go out, and the Lord's word will go out from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations, and he will mediate for many peoples. Then they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, nor will they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come, and let us walk in the light of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Our psalm today is Psalm 24. We'll hear the refrain, we'll sing the refrain, and we'll read responsibly. your heads, you gates, lift them up, you ancient doors. Who is he, this King of glory? Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. written in Paul's letter to the Philippians, the fourth chapter, Paul encourages us to rejoice in the Lord. We can do that because we are living in his kingdom now, his kingdom of forgiveness and joy and salvation, and we can do that because we know where we're going. We know that we're going to be saved and have been saved by him. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's rise for our gospel acclamation, and today, of course, we sing the words for Advent and Christmas. written in the 21st chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel. Uh, it's the story of Palm Sunday, the account of Palm Sunday, and as Jesus came into the city, 
the people praised him as the Messiah who has come, the King who has come. And uh, we look forward to celebrating his coming again in just a few weeks and look forward to him coming again at the end of the world. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, telling them, Go to the village ahead of you. Immediately you will find a donkey tied there along with her colt. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you are to say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king comes to you humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did just as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their outer clothing on them, and he sat on it. A very large crowd spread their outer clothing on the road. Others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. The crowds who went in front of him and those who followed kept shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, asking, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth and Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated, and we'll sing our next hymn. <laughs> and peace be yours from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, from God our Father, and from the Holy Spirit. The Word of God that we look at today, selected verses from Genesis chapter 3 and from John chapter 3. Now the servant was more clever than any wild animal which the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Has God really said, You shall not eat from any tree in the garden? Skipping down a little bit, it says, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was appealing to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took some of its fruit and ate. She gave some also to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Skipping down a little farther, the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the livestock and more than every wild animal. You shall crawl on your belly, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. 
And I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He will crush your head and you will crush his heel. Then going to John chapter 3, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And this is the word of God. But dear friends in Christ, there is a saying that goes like this, a picture is worth a thousand words. And so the meaning of that saying is that you can show someone a picture and it will explain something better than a whole lot of words can do. Now the Bible is full of many pictures. And I'm not just talking about those glossy, colorful Bible story pictures that some Bibles have, you know, spaced intermittently throughout the book. But I'm talking about word pictures. Word pictures like the parables that Jesus told to illustrate a Bible truth. Or word pictures like similes or metaphors that different writers use so that they could explain a perhaps complicated Bible concept in a picture and then it would make more sense. As I said in the beginning, the theme for this Advent and Christmas season is illustrations of Emmanuel. And so we're going to look at different pictures. There's different pictures in the Bible for telling Emmanuel and who he would be and what he would do. And so we're going to look at some of them as we work our way through Advent and as we come to the Christmas season. Today we're going to talk about snakes. And so there is that graphic in our bulletin that has six different pictures, illustrations of Emmanuel, top left corner. There is a snake. Do you like snakes? I don't know that I know anybody who really says I like snakes because snakes are kind of slimy and snakes are kind of gross. Who likes snakes? And yet, the devil used a snake to tempt Adam and Eve into sin. And then later on in the Bible, God used a snake to save his people. And God use that picture of a snake to teach us something about the Messiah, Emmanuel. And so our theme today, I like snakes. Who says that? Nobody says that, right? Nobody says, I like snakes. So the snake's big claim to fame, his first big claim to fame is Genesis chapter 3, when the devil used the snake to tempt Adam and Eve into sin. Now, why did he pick the snake? It says in our text that the snake was more clever than any wild animal. How do we understand that? What was it about the snake that made him more clever? We don't really know, but that's what it says. Was it the way the snake looked? Was it how the snake acted? We think of foxes as being clever too. That word, clever, does not necessarily have a negative connotation. Because at this point, all the animals were perfect and holy. It was still, God made everything. It was very good, so he made the snake. The snake was all very good. And so nothing bad about the snake being clever. But you have to kind of wonder why you didn't think to yourself, why is this snake talking to me? The snake maybe was clever, but was it clever enough to talk to people? So maybe a red flag should have gone up there. After Eve fell into sin, then God put a curse on the snake, and this is from verse 14. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the livestock and more than every wild animal. You shall crawl on your belly and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. So as a tool that the devil used, God now put a curse on that tool and said you're gonna crawl on your belly. Now, did that mean that before that, snakes had legs? Maybe, but not necessarily. But the curse is when you see a snake, slithering through the dirt or through the grass and its head is going back and forth like the way it is and that fork tongue is just coming in and coming out like that. You go, oh, this is really gross. What a nasty looking animal. And that's the curse. For the most part, people don't like snakes. 
Now, if you're a fan of snakes and you think, well, why is a snake getting such a bum rap? What's wrong with snakes? Think about sitting around a campfire some night and having a snake slither up your leg on the inside of your jeans. That would be pretty gross, wouldn't it? Or camping out under the stars and having a snake slide into your sleeping bag in the middle of the night. That would be kind of gross, wouldn't it? And so snakes are nasty and that's the curse. <coughs> Later on in the Bible, God chose snakes to punish his people. And just to review a story, we're familiar with the story, the children of Israel have been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And the time has now come for them to go into the promised land. So they're making their way up to the promised land. They're going to go east of the Dead Sea and go in by Jericho. And they come to Edom, and they ask permission to go through the land of Edom. And the king of Edom says, no way, you're not going through our land. And so they have to go all the way back south, all the way around Edom. It lengthens their journey. This is what we read in Numbers chapter 21. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Look, there is no food, there is no water, and we are disgusted by this worthless food, which is man, which they had been eating for 40 years. And so as soon as things go wrong for the children of Israel, they start grumbling and complaining against Moses, against Aaron, against God. We've seen this over and over again with the children of Israel, right? This is their go-to. And so God sent snakes, poisonous snakes, coming into the camp, fighting the people. Many people are dying. Think of how frightening that must have been for them. All of a sudden, there's all these poisonous snakes all over. Their friends or family are dying. And so the snakes did their job, didn't they? And as the children of Israel see that, then they cry out to Moses, pray to the Lord for us that he would save us from the snakes. The snakes led the people to repentance so that they would cry out to Moses because God had put this curse on them. How about us? Are we cursed? Do we sin? Do we do things wrong? Do we make mistakes? Do we hurt other people? Do we go against what God says he wants us to do? The answer to all of those questions is yes. Right? Yes, we are sinners. And because we are sinners, then the curse of God has been put on us. The punishment of sin, the curse of sin, the curse of death has been put on us because we are sinners. Also, God said to Adam, after he sinned, now the ground is going to be cursed. And he said to Eve, you're going to have pain and bearing child. So the curse of everyday life was put on them and is on us too now. We live in a world that's cursed with suffering and pain and trouble and heartache. All because of our sins. All that curse has been put on us. And the, the biggest curse of all, of course, is death. God said to Adam and Eve, if you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. They ate of the fruit, and they're not around anymore, right? They're gone. People who have come after Adam and Eve, they are also gone. And we know the pain of this curse, and we know that someday this curse is going to come to all of us. Someday we will all have to die. And so this is the curse because of our sin. We live in a world that's cursed because of our sin. And yet now it's Christmas time, right? We're starting Advent. We're in the season of Christmas. As the song goes, Christmas is the most wonderful time of the year, <clears throat> the happiest season of all. Is that true? Well, yes, to some extent it is true, right? But the days of December are still cursed, right? We still are going to sin in December. We still are going to feel guilty about our sins in December. People are still going to get sick. Troubles are going to come to people. People are going to pass away in December because a curse has been put on us because of our sin. It's no wonder that people don't like snakes. Thanks a lot, snake, for what you did. And yet we can't blame the snake because Adam and Eve made that choice on their own and we can't put the blame of our sin on the snakes or on the devil and say the devil made me do it because we sinned. And yet God in his mercy and grace has saved us from our sin. He used the snake to save his people, and he 
use that snake to illustrate for us the Savior we do have. So, again, we go back to that account of the children of Israel in the desert. And after they prayed to Moses, prayed to God that he would save us from the snake, then God said to Moses, make a snake and put it up on a pole and everyone who looks on that snake will be saved, even if they're bitten by the poisonous snake. And so that's what he did. And when they looked at the snake, they were saved. Now it's not that that snake had special ordinary powers, but God had promised. And so when they trusted in God and looked at that snake in faith, they were saved by their faith in God, by their trust. In his word. And so that's the salvation that God brought to his people to save them from death, temporal death. And Moses, or Jesus then said about Moses, John chapter 3, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And so Jesus says that snake is a picture of what I would do, just as the people looked at that snake in faith, so we look at Jesus in faith, because he has come to be our Savior. And the cool part of Jesus being our Savior is how God made that promise to Adam and Eve right after they sinned. I will put hostility between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He will crush your head, and you will crush his heel. It's almost like God knew. Go figure. It's almost like God knew that Adam and Eve were going to sin. And it's almost like God had a plan already because as soon as they sinned, bam, here it is. Here's the plan I have for you. God knew exactly what they were going to do and he knew exactly what his plan, his plan was going to be to send his son to be the Savior. And isn't that amazing love that even before God created us, he knew we were going to rebel and turn against him and sin, and he made us anyway. He created us anyway, and then came up with this plan to save us. And that verse then talks about curses, and there's three parts to that verse. There's hostility between the woman and the snake. So, you know, Eve was not very happy with that snake and with the devil for leading her into sin, and so there's that hostility. There's hostility between the devil's seed and Eve's seed. So the people who follow the devil and the rest of us, the believers who are children of Eve. But then that verse comes all down to one seed of a woman would crush the devil's head in our place. His heel would be crushed but he would crush the devil's head. And so when Jesus came, he crushed and destroyed all the curses for us. No more curse of sin. Yes, we still sin and feel guilty for our sin, but Jesus has taken away that curse because there's no condemnation anymore. There's no punishment. Sin is gone. It's all forgiven. It's all washed away. We don't have to carry that guilt with us. That curse is gone. He crushed the curse of the devil. We don't talk to snakes the way that Eve did, but the devil gets in our head and the devil tempts us and he's still going to tempt us, even though Jesus crushed him. And yet, because Jesus crushed him, we can say, devil, take a hike. If he's trying to get in our head and tempt us, we can say, no, I don't want to do that because Jesus died for me. And if he's throwing our sins up in our face and say, look at how guilty you are, we can say, Jesus paid for all of that. Your power is taken away. He crushed the curse of death. Yes, we're still going to die. And yet, as Jesus said, he is a resurrection and a life, and whoever believes in him will live, even though they die. And whoever lives and believes in him will never die. And so that curse is taken away. And all of this, because God sent his son to be our Emmanuel, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. How awesome that God sent his Son, that that little baby lying in a manger is God, 
true God, the <coughs> eternal God, the all-knowing God, the all-powerful God, took on human flesh and blood and sent a helpless little baby lying in a manger. How awesome that this little baby lying in a manger is God's only begotten son, the one he loves so much, the one who is part of the Trinity, and yet God gave him up for us. Put us ahead of his own son so that we could be saved. That little baby lying in a manger looks so cute and cuddly, and yet he is going to have to die on the cross. He's going to have to suffer that horrible death so that we can be saved, so that he can be our Emmanuel, Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now there may be some times when we would just as soon be alone. Like if you're sitting by the lake and you're in your own thoughts and, and you're just kind of quietly sitting there, you don't want someone over here jabbering in there. If you're reading a book all cuddled up in your recliner, you don't want someone jabbering in your ear, you just want to read your book. And yet there's other times when we don't want to be alone. Like if we're sitting in a surgical waiting room waiting to hear how the results of the surgery come out, or if we slide off the road on a snowy day, or if we just heard some devastating news, we don't want to be alone then, do we? But we're not. We're never alone because Jesus is Emmanuel. Always with us. God who is with us. Because he died to bring us back to him, to atone us to him. And so this snake is a picture of Jesus who came to be our Savior. What a beautiful illustration. As we said, we're coming up on the Christmas season. Some of us maybe have already started celebrating. But it's still a few weeks away, isn't it? That's going to go fast. <laughs> all the stuff that's involved in Christmas. But whatever we're doing, all the celebrations, all the parties, all the decorating, all the baking... Let's remember Emmanuel. This is what it's all about. It's about our Savior who came to die for us so that he could live with us and we can live with him in heaven. Amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's now join in confessing our faith. We use the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, the eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And let us pray. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we stand before you with heads bowed in humble awe and reverence. You present to us a most remarkable mystery, for you are both God and human. Through you, all things were created in heaven and on earth, and still you decided to come here as our brother to live in lowliness and to suffer and die for our sins on the cross. All this you did because of your great love for us wretched sinners. How can our mortal lips sing all the praise that is due your holy saving name? 
As members of your kingdom by faith, we long to see the day when you will come again and take us to heaven. All the glory of that day when we will hear the sound of your voice calling the dead from their graves, how we long to behold your majesty as you invite the faithful to share joys and pleasures that last forever. Until that day, intercede to the Father in our behalf for all of our needs. Be ever near to guard and defend, to cheer and comfort us, and to lend us your aid. All of this we ask in your holy name. Amen. In our prayers this morning, we also pray for Chumley Mays, who is in the hospital in Appleton, and for Dick Duclo, who earlier in the week was in the hospital in Ripon. We pray. Heavenly Father, look down from above upon our Christian brothers who have been healed. We ask you to visit them with your tender mercy. Be gracious to them in your hour of distress, and if it is according to your loving will, renew their strength. You are the great physician who has power to make whole, and for that we pray. We pray that you would also grant them a rich measure of your Holy Spirit, that their faith may be firm amidst the adversities, and that they may look to you for every help and blessing. In your name we pray, amen. At this time, an offering will be brought forward. Continue with the service of Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. That's right. <coughs> Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy is yours Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.
say good morning. Welcome. If you're visiting us, especially, we welcome you today. Some things to mention. Um, we had our first Sunday school practice this morning, Hanukkah. Lucas said it went pretty long. Asher says, good job, everyone. All right, that's good. So it continues uh, every week um, up until Christmas Eve at 8 o'clock on Sunday morning. Um, so there's, uh, we're coming to the end of our collections for food pantry, pajamas, toys, um, pajamas on Friday, um, food pantry and toys next Sunday. Thank you to everyone who's been bringing stuff. We appreciate that. Um, it will be certainly appreciated by the people in our community. Also, um, Tree of Love slips are by the door if you'd like to um, put a name on the Tree of Love. Um, they're there. If you would like to help with um, the hearts, it's kind of putsy work, but if you would like to help with writing on the hearts to hang on the tree, let me know. That would be awesome. Um, let's see, uh, volunteers for cleaning and for doing the altar stuff. So um, there's still some spots available and we're council is meeting tomorrow. So if you're thinking about that at all, either talk to Gail or myself or put your name down and, and uh, so we'll evaluate uh, where we are with uh, volunteers for that. Well, Dick Duclo had a stroke um, last week and then again on Sunday and was in the hospital in Ripon for a good part of the week and is now at Whispering Pines in Ripon. And so he maybe will be coming to Marquezan. Um, so we'll keep him in our prayers. And then Chunley remains at um, Theta Care in Appleton. They were not able to do the ablation for him on Tuesday. Um, Rose said kind of a better day yesterday. Some fluid coming off and um, sleeping a little bit more. So we're thankful for the little steps. We pray they continue. So um, let's see here. Uh, also, another opportunity to help out, Darren Miller is involved in Special Olympics, especially bowling, so there's some sheets on the table. Actually, there's envelopes, and in the envelope is a sheet that you can fill out and then put in the envelope and mail it to Green Lake County Special Olympics. There's a stamp on it and everything if you'd be interested in helping that organization out. We want to thank Dennis for, Dennis Pesky for the beautiful contribution box or offering box. You made me notice that as you came in. I don't know how you couldn't have noticed it as you came in. Our ice cream bucket is gone. So we have a beautiful box. So thank you, Dennis, for making that for us. Birthdays. Yes, Ashley. Tomorrow, Monday. Tomorrow, Monday. Brother Carrie. 14. Wow. <laughs> He's getting old, hey? And you enjoyed that, didn't you? <laughs> I feel like somewhere back in here, there's a birthday, maybe yesterday, was it? Marlene? Yeah, you know. Friday, Friday. I learned something interesting yesterday, though, about your birthday and about you, I learned that Moses was in your confirmation class. Is that true? <laughs> I'm not saying what I heard. It. You just heard it. Anyone else? Anniversaries. Yes, Gloria. Oh, today. Happy birthday, John. Anyone else? Oh, up, up top there. Who is that? I can't hear. Laney. Laney. It's his birth, it was his birthday last week, Saturday. Grady's birthday, huh? Thumbs up for Grady. All right, happy birthday, Grady. Anyone else? Anniversaries, too? All right. Uh, everyone have a good week.